at the Olympics, walking out to the opening ceremony to what, 40, 50,000 people? It's like being an All Black, I guess. Right here, right now, yes, skiing is everything about my life. I'm a professional in what I do. Uh, it's basically my job, it's my full-time job. I probably work two to three times harder than any full-time employee um, or business owner out there in the community. So basically what I do, I do it for free, I do it for the love and the passion. It will mean a lot to me to even be at the Winter Paralympics, to show myself that I can stick at something, how much I want to push myself. That's the only barrier that there is between now and the Paralympics, so it's all up to me. Paralympic skiers Adam Hall and Peter Williams are dogged and determined to stand on the podium at this year's Winter Paralympics in Vancouver. Just stepping off the start line is a victory, the culmination of years of hard grind. Adam Hall will be the most severely disabled athlete racing as a standing skier at this year's Paralympic Games in Vancouver, Canada. Adam's spina bifida means he has no feeling in the lower half of his legs and no sensation in his feet whatsoever. Yet he skis with precision. Medics scratch their heads as to how he does it. I always get told that I'm stupid and I shouldn't carry on and shouldn't do this and that. No, when I broke my knee, I strapped it up with gaffer tape and kept on going. He's going into the world event with a ruptured knee, yet ranked world number two. Peter Williams is New Zealand's second skiing wonder. Born with spina bifida, doctors never expected he'd live. Peter's level of disability means he competes from a sit ski. You do get a lot more speed just because you feel that you're closer to the ground and you just go for it. His powerful upper body drives his performance. He's chosen to pursue this dream despite carrying a major injury. In his case, a dislocated shoulder. Just taking that risk and just pushing through and, oh, whoops, there goes the shoulder. But you, you've just got to take risks. They have something to prove to the rest of the world, you know, and, you know, seeing that they want to be recognized as athletes first, you know, not as disabled athletes. They want to be recognized as athletes. And I think, uh, you know, people like Adam Hall and, and Peter Williams show that, uh, they show that, that commitment in that level of, of trying to be the best in the world. Without being cocky, I kind of believe that uh, the team that I have behind me that supported me uh, and myself are world champions, uh, Olympic champions. It's not about the day in March, you don't become it on the day. Uh, it's all about the team, the preparation, the build up to the games. The Kiwis train with 25 international Paralympic athletes at Winter Park, Colorado. It's the final stage of training. The competition is just days away. Adam will compete in the slalom, giant slalom, super combined and downhill. Racing at speeds of almost 120 kilometres an hour, putting enormous pressure on limbs that are already under strain due to his disability. Um, we've done some tests last year with, with pressure in my boot and you know during the most important part and phase of the turn I'm, I'm pushing about 250-300 kgs of force. And that's a lot of force, especially for my sticks that, that don't even really work properly. Over the New Zealand summer, Adam competed at World Champs in Austria, winning in Salem. But a gold medal at the Paralympics is now in his sights. I'm really, really focused on this. I mean, I kind of tell people that Vancouver is like my girlfriend in a way because I sleep about it, I dream about it. I, everything is about it, is about Vancouver. By contrast, Peter's an underdog in his class. He scraped in for selection to compete in the slalom and giant slalom in Vancouver. Other people have sort of said, oh yeah, yeah, good luck at getting to the Olympics. But it, it is, it's, it's, I just want to prove to them and myself and just do the best I can with this Paralympic uh, goal and dream of mine. Our camera has been following Adam since he came home from the Torino Paralympics four years ago. Back then, he was virtually unknown, ranked 49th in the world. Being named in the New Zealand Paralympic team to go to Torino was a big thrill. It doesn't come overnight and me, myself, I still have a long way to go, um, even after Torino. So I'm not at my peak yet and we'll see what the future brings. 
Two years later, Adam returned to the family farm in Dunedin from the World Cup circuit with a golden slalom. His dad put him straight back to work, milking cows. By 2008, his world ranking for slalom was number two. Four years ago, Peter Williams stitched a career in journalism in favour of pursuing his Paralympic dream. Living on a shoestring, he became completely focused on training at all weathers, enduring winters back to back. And this is my go faster cover. Right from childhood, Peter's family sought ways to include him in family fun. Skiing was something that my parents did and my sister at the age of two and a half was doing. And my parents really wanted something that we could all do as a family. His first trip to Winter Park, Colorado was a family holiday. My memory of skiing in Winter Park was being sort of tethered. Uh, I was on uh, what Adam Hall does, two track, uh, so four tracking, so I had outriggers on my crutches on my arms and two skis that were uh, tied together and I just I had because I had limited strength in my legs I basically had to get held the whole time so there was no independent skiing. Well that that first one was just after Pete was born they gave me the photo because they took Pete down to the um, neonatal ward where all the sick babies go. So I was given this blurred photo of my baby to take back to the room, and that's all I had. Well, when he came out, um, I saw that his feet were very, very deformed. And at that stage, the doctor, because there were all sorts of complications and things, and he was stressed, and the doctor actually didn't realise he was spina bifida. And they whipped him away, and the nurse saw he was. And I was busy harping on what's wrong with my baby what's wrong with my baby when I was first born I know that my my mum was told oh don't don't bother feeding him uh, he'll be dead within a couple of days seven years on and the young Peter had endured 30 major operations he's 26 now and he's outlived the medical world's expectations the doctors still put time limits on my life um, but as they put these time limits on, on my life, I keep uh, proving them wrong. For the past four years, Wanaka's become Adam's second home. You know, I don't really look at any forecast or anything. I just wake up in the morning and, and whatever it is, it is. Knife, measuring tape, and straight. Adam is referred to in skiing as a four-tracker. His skis are tethered with rope. Wouldn't make a very good carpenter, that's for sure. And instead of ski poles, he uses two crutches with mini skis for balance. Oh, I don't have the muscles in my legs to, to keep my legs together, so when the string snaps, both my legs go whatever way they decide to go on the day. Cadrona is one of four New Zealand ski fields that promotes adaptive skiing and has physiotherapists and medical experts on site. You never know when Adam will need them. So I fall over all the time, so um, I know what I'm doing, I suppose, when I fall over. By far the hardest part of the day, putting the old boots on. My left leg's my worst leg, just with the way it is and the angles that it has, it's kind of a bit more messed up, I guess, so. Um, I have to be really careful when I put my left boot on. You know, sometimes my knee can pop if I put it in as well. When I first started skiing, it was very difficult. I didn't really have much help. People left me in the cafeteria just to kind of sit there because I was so bad. And my dad actually spent a lot of time away from the farm most weekends and school holidays trying to, you know, push me even more and show me that, you know, I can get up there and I can do it. You know, being teased as a little kid was having a disability. They kind of grew me as a whole person because, you know, self-esteem is a huge important thing with somebody with a disability because you can just wave, you know, stupid comments off and just get on with your daily life. <laughs> I got on a plane when I was about 14 years old uh, to Canada for three months and that was the first time that I had to look after myself, I had to do everything and at such a young age, you know, that's what really built my confidence, built my self-esteem. Okay, 
Hey. How's it going? Good, how are you? Okay. Oh, not too much. Same old. Yeah. Yeah, really good actually. Having a disability of spina bifida and the way that I walk, just walking puts a lot of strain on my legs, on my knees, on my hips, on everything. So Adam um, ruptured his ACL, and the ACL is the major ligament that lives inside the knee and um, makes the knee stable. So most people couldn't ski without an ACL. Most people have to have surgery, but. Um, because of the way Adam skis and because he's a stubborn bugger, <laughs> um, he's opted for uh, to ski without surgery. I'm more comfortable skiing anywhere. If I could ski 24-7, it would be more healthy than me walking. Morning, good morning. Six months out from the Paralympics in Vancouver, and Peter is yet to qualify. The Winter Games in Queenstown are his last chance. These games are the, the real thing. Uh, for selection for 2010, I've got to get uh, top six. Peter's proving a point on two fronts. Superficially, he wants to win a medal. But there's a lot more he wants people to know about his drive and determination to have a solid future. And that includes a job. I finished near the top of my class in university, but that doesn't seem to make any difference. I was totally stonewalled by so many employers. Oh no, we can't accommodate your needs. We don't think you're right for the role. And you could just see that they were looking purely at the, at the wheelchair. So I was like, well, what do I do to prove that I can be of use to employers? And one of my now sponsors said, well, get back into skiing, you know, show, show them that you can achieve at a high level. Peter Williams, folks, and in for a finish for Pete Williams. Well done, Pete. The selectors said top uh, six in GS in slalom, so I finished sixth in the GS the other day and finished fourth today. Adam doesn't need a win. He's already secured his place on the New Zealand Winter Paralympic team. But nothing but number one is ever good enough. Everybody wants to know about the gold medal. Nobody really cares about the silver or the bronze. And everyone's expecting Adam to clean up. But even before he checks the score, he knows it wasn't his best run. You know, everyone's skiing well, so I look forward to the, to the next few months of training. Adam finished second in the slalom and third in the giant slalom. He's not happy. Peter's been forced back to Auckland. Although he's qualified, his whole campaign's in jeopardy. He's busted his shoulder and probably shouldn't ski at all. So what happened on the 1st of March is that Peter fell onto his left shoulder and quickly, can you show the action, pushed himself up from his rigger and dislocated his right shoulder. This is a normal shoulder, but in Peter's shoulder, the force of the injury completely separated the ball from its socket. Now with his skiing, he needs obviously excellent shoulder control. He's getting it. He uses his upper body every day, all day, a lot more than the rest of us. Peter's shoulder injury means he hasn't skied in 12 weeks, seriously affecting his chance of a podium finish in Vancouver, which is barely three months away. I'd normally be up at Snow Planet at least twice a week, um, but since the course of my shoulder, it's been more of a, uh, a worry to me that I was going to dislocate it again. It's, it's more of a confidence thing now that my shoulder is actually quite strong. I need to get it in my head that I can uh, be a little bit more daring. Both these men are powering from a limited number of muscles. They need to draw on every bit of function. I rely on my upper body to do so much, so I have Sometimes I have neck problems, I have shoulder problems. I also have a really uh, subluxed hip, which is due to being born with that, but also with some ski crashes, it's maybe made it worse as well. And also, you know, there's a lot of aching that you have on a day-to-day -day basis with muscles and training so hard. For the past two years, Peter's girlfriend Jo has supported him in his campaign for gold. 
but wanting to be the best in the world means sacrifice. From now until the Olympics, it's unfortunately has to be about me. Just days before Peter departs for training in Winter Park, Colorado, they have to come to terms with living apart. I've kind of accepted that <laughs> it's all about the Paralympics. <laughs> I'm a little bit reluctantly, but it's just the way it has to be. I've got a, our relationship in a way has to take a back seat, and that's just and the reality of any, I think, um, professional sport. Um, when it gets to that level, you just or have any, to... Or any goals that you may have in the future, mm. hey, that'll be my time that I need to support you, so it's... Mm. The Kiwis are back in Winter Park, Colorado. Training at 3,000 metres above sea level, altitude sickness is not uncommon. Musical instruments in the snow? Only in America. Uh, you know, this is my sixth season back here in town, and I guess you could probably say I'm pretty much a local by now. Oh, good shot! Right in the butt. Paralympics New Zealand supports Adam, but it can't afford to fund both athletes. Peter's pulled together sponsorship from small businesses to finance his campaign. Ah, good morning. But it doesn't allow for much. Let me show you around my huge flat. This is the kitchen, my flat made arena. Yeah, this is my very spacious bathroom. I have to crawl, crawl in there. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's Joe and I. That's Joe. I've been here, what, 24, 48, 72 hours. I've probably called Joe five times. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you know, distractions is one thing that um, I try to stay away from because any single little thing that's going to uh, inflict my, my performance towards getting that gold medal, um, I, I step away and go back and kind of, you know, I best perform in, in my raccoon as such. If, if I step away from, from the outside world and just do what i got to do, then, um, you know, that's what works best for me. Sitski racing is divided into five groups of competition, classified by the athlete's physical function. Peter's classed an LW11. That's a monoscare who has good control of their core muscles. Peter's seat clips into a regular ski. Even with years of practice, getting into it's tricky. Yeah, um, it's the first time this season, so it's just got to get used to that, find that balance point pretty, pretty quickly. It's the whole gear, the cover, the mono, uh, and the uh, outriggers, you're probably looking at about 8,000 kiwi. So it's uh, a lot of money to find straight up. Probably with nine pairs of skis in total is probably fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, if not more. Probably twenty-five thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars worth if you include the plates, the bindings, uh, the whole lot. Mono skiing demands massive strength and flexibility from the shoulders and arms. Peter's permanently weakened his right shoulder. The risk of it dislocating again is high. Uh, first time on snow in three months. Yeah, my shoulder was feeling really good. I uh, had the physio before I left. Um, and she advised me to just keep on with the uh, sports massage. So I've uh, organised that starting next week. So, um, OK. Just keep, keep the shoulders moving and working and nice and relaxed and everything will be great. Uh, these are my new skis that I haven't tried before, so I'm just going to be getting used to them, uh, doing my usual routine, getting warmed up. Um, a couple of drills to wake up some muscles because it's been a couple of months. And um, then I'll slowly get into some free skiing a bit faster. I mean, Adam's probably the hardest working athlete in the world right now. The fact that he, he comes from what I, what I refer to as salt to the earth, you know, being growing up on a farm and, and you know, having to milk cows. I mean, he comes out here, you know, has a tremendous work ethic, you know, you know and that work ethic is, is shown through in, in his success in the, in the World Cup level. I'm, I'm hoping for gold. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe in him. You know, you know, if Adam puts his best skiing on the hill you know, and gives, gives himself the opportunity to be successful, you know, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason why he should be getting gold. For Adam, the top prize of the Paralympics is all-consuming. When he's not skiing 
or lifting weights, he's visualising that day in Vancouver where he's confident he'll take gold. I mean, they just released um, the Olympic and the Paralympic medals before I came out. Um, so I printed this off for some inspiration and I'll put this up on my wall. Perfect, I can wake up in the morning and look at that every morning and uh, give me some more drive towards my, my goal. I really don't like the word handicap that they use here in the United States. Uh, it's a bit 1980s for me, uh, just like crippled. Uh, that's, that word's still around in the, uh, the US vocabulary. Handicap is a big, uh, a big name that's used in America. And, and handicap actually came around um, back in the days with homeless people on the side of the road with caps. They would um, hold their caps out begging for money. So handicap actually means bigger. I don't think anybody with a disability out there is really a beggar. So, to me, you know, I'm proud to um, have a disability in a way. It's my uniform, it's my badge, it's who I am. I believe that everybody out there has a disability in some way. <laughs> no, I think we're both pretty competitive, but uh, we just take different approaches. Ah. Thank you all. It's not about being the best, but just trying your best in everything and not giving up and just trying to kick butt and win. <laughs> and I lost. Whoops. Good game. Yeah. Good two games. Luck. Luck, yes. Peter has been a part of our program for the last three years. He's really made a, a strong endeavor to, to make the 2010 uh, Paralympic Games. Barriers to getting the gold and the goal. Um, really keeping focused, getting out there every single training run and working on that one thing that I've said I'm gonna work on. Spoken to the coach, uh, just need to get a little bit more angulation uh, sort of in my lower torso. Uh, but it's early days, I've got time to work on it. His challenge is to really to, to increase the risk a little bit and, and challenge himself, you know, with the with the speed and, and you know embrace the speed that, that the hill gives him. He has a good technical base, but sometimes he, he needs to just let it go a little bit. He'll need to push well beyond the safety zone to even come close to the goal. The reality is, it's a risk. Every day we're out there, it's dangerous. It has, it has its dangers for sure. Every turn, uh, you can break a leg just like that. I make one wrong move and I lose another 15% of my body. That scares me. People in the sport have broken their backs, have broken their necks, and people have been killed. In those events, we're going anywhere from 80 kilometres up to about 120 kilometres an hour. Um, you know, and that's faster than what your car's legally allowed to go on the road. Even when you're going halfway through a turn with all that pressure, I mean, that pressure, when you release 250, 300 kgs of force, it can throw you anywhere. It can throw you into a tree. It can throw you into someone else. It can throw you into the ice. It can do some damage. Peter was never expected to live longer than a few weeks. And no one ever thought he'd get on New Zealand's Paralympic ski team. He deals quietly with the challenge in front of him. This is just another challenge of being not quite there, but having the potential to be there. I think I've got every, or I know, I've got every chance to be on the podium in Vancouver. I know I can race incredibly well when it counts. I've just got to keep training hard so that I can be at my you know, best performance in Vancouver.
Every single day, probably almost every hour of the day that I'm awake, I am thinking of myself in Vancouver, going down the course, what my runs are going to be like, how my skis are going through the snow, what the conditions are going to be like, finishing the race, being on top of that podium with a gold medal around my neck, with the national anthem playing, you know, and being amongst all my friends and family that'll be there watching, all the way to getting home in Dunedin and standing off the aeroplane to, you know, hopefully getting off the plane to more support and showing them, you know, what they've helped me to achieve.